This is Duke University. My name is Neil Siegel and I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Uh, today's event is going to focus on important criminal decisions during the October 2011 term, the term that began in the first Monday in October in 2011 and ended on June 28th of 2012. Now you may have heard of certain decisions from last term that some people think were important, something about health care and I don't know if it was the Commerce Clause or the tax power. Um, another case involving Arizona and immigration, and lots of civil cases that got headlines. It turns out the court rendered more than a few very consequential decisions in the criminal area, decisions that will have a huge impact in the day-to-day -day administration of the criminal justice system in the United States. And I have uh, uh, for you today an all-star panel of crim law, criminal procedure experts who are going to tell you about these decisions. Uh, if the police decide they just want to attach a GPS device to your car and follow you for a month, is that okay? Or is that a Fourth Amendment problem? Uh, what if they want to attach a GPS to advice to the car of a justice and follow the justice around for a month? Right, an even more, more alarming proposition. Uh, <coughs> is it uh, within the scope, uh, excuse me, does it violate the Eighth Amendment? Is it cruel and unusual punishment to sentence uh, a juvenile murder to life without the possibility of parole? To what extent does the Constitution police eyewitness identifications that take place under very questionable circumstances? What about routine strip searches in prisons? Any constitutional problem <coughs> with that? Plea bargaining. What if you have a really bad lawyer and because of some really bad advice you reject a plea deal from the government? Maybe your lawyer says, yeah, you shot the victim multiple times. But don't worry, you can't be convicted of attempted murder because all the shots landed below the belt. Do you have a claim for ineffective assistance of counsel? Or do you only have such a claim if you go to trial? What about the confrontation clause? The court's confrontation clause jurisprudence has been really confusing, and it just got more confusing. Our panel of experts are going to tell you about all these decisions and more. Uh, uh, we have Nita Farahani, who's going to get us started, a very prominent uh, law professor who just joined our faculty this year. We're very pleased uh, to have her. Uh, next to her is Professor Jim Coleman, who all of you I'm sure know, who's going to speak to us as well. And then to his last, prof uh, Professor Sam Buell and Lisa Griffin, uh, uh, core members of our crim law faculty. So without further ado, we'll begin with Professor Farahani. Thank you. It's a uh great to be back here. I may be new to the faculty, but I was a student here at Duke Law School, so it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and particularly to talk about two interesting cases on the Fourth Amendment side that the court issued last term. Um, and I'm going to start uh, with the assumption that not everybody here has an intimate knowledge of Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, just to give you a little bit of Fourth Amendment context before going into these two cases. So if we're dealing with a Fourth Amendment case, um, the court asked two questions. The first question is, did a search occur? And that seems like sort of an odd question in our ordinary parlance because most of the time you would think it's pretty easy to answer that question, except the court answers that question in kind of a quirky way that I'll talk about in a moment. If it is a search, then we get to the second question, which is, is it an unreasonable search? And I'm using search collapsed here with search and seizure. It's, is it a search or seizure? Is it a, um, and then is it an unreasonable search or seizure? So for the first question of, is it a search, the court doesn't just say like, okay, our ordinary concept of if you're looking through something, that's a search. Instead, they say, does the person or the thing that is being searched, does the person whose thing that is have any individual interest that is infringed by the government looking through, conducting the investigation in the way that they did? And if the person doesn't have any interest, then there's no search that occurred, which means we never get to the second question, which is, was it an unreasonable search? And a number of cases actually stop at that first question. The court says, it wasn't a search, therefore we don't have to get into any other questions. And so the hard question at that first stop is, what individual interests count? What matters? What rights does an individual have that could actually be infringed by the government in order for the court to decide, yes, a search has in fact occurred, for it to then get past that threshold question and then say, has an unreasonable search occurred as well? And the two cases 
that came up last term deal with this at different points. So the first case that was decided was Jones v. United States, which really dealt with that first question, is it a search? The second case, it was self-evident that it was a search given the facts, and I'll get into that. Um, so it was focusing on the second question, which is given that it is a search, was it an unreasonable search? Now this is important because the implications for these cases and the likely impact that they'll have really depends on where that analysis is happening. Is it happening at step one or is it happening at step two? Okay, so let's start with Jones v. U.S. I'm sure many of you heard at least bits about this case because it really made a lot of headline news. Um, and this is the case in which uh, the question was, could the police attach a GPS tracking device to a person's vehicle um, and then use that GPS tracking device to monitor the vehicle's movements on public streets? And the question there was, does that constitute a search or seizure? And that's, again, step one inquiry. Was it a search or seizure? And the police in this instance said, that's not a search or seizure because there's a doctrine that says, when you voluntarily expose yourself to the public, then you have no expectation of privacy. So they're drawing on a previous Supreme Court case, which is Katz, and Katz set up this um, way of thinking about individual interests to say, if you have an expectation of privacy that you both subjectively have and society recognizes as reasonable, then, and that interest is violated, that expectation of privacy, then a search has occurred. So the police said, well, look, this person is just driving around in public, so maybe when they go into their home, if the police continue to use the GPS tracking device, then it would violate an expectation of privacy, but if you're tracking somebody who's out in public, no search has occurred. Well, the thing that the majority opinion focused on in this case is the way in which the GPS tracking device was actually attached. Now, an important side note, this was a warrantless search. Many searches are looking after the fact where the government didn't get a warrant. They, in fact, did get a warrant in this case, but the warrant lasted 10 days. And on the 11th day, they attached the GPS tracking device. So the police didn't use an OnStar system that was built into the car. They didn't use the phone that the person was carrying around. What they did was actually attach a physical device to the car while it was in a public place. And then they had to change the battery because they tracked the GPS tracking device for 28 days. And so another time that the car was in a public place, they changed the battery. Okay? And the court focused on that, the majority. The majority said, what this is, is if you go back to the beginning of the Fourth Amendment, the idea of the Fourth Amendment, the individual interests that were protected were property rights. And when the police trespass upon a person's property, then an individual interest has actually been implicated. Okay, so they said because a trespass has occurred, because property rights were implicated, then a search has occurred. They didn't get to the second question. The second question being, was it an unreasonable search? Right, the only question that they're answering here is, this in fact was a search, now we've gotta figure out whether or not it was an unreasonable search. And there were two concurrences written in this case, one by Justice Sotomayor, one by Justice Alito. And Justice Sotomayor thought, you know, yeah, I agree, you can't trespass on somebody's property, but the real issue here, the thing we really care about is if you're tracking somebody's every move for 28 days, okay, if you're tracking their every move for 28 days, that's the real privacy interest that's at stake here. That's the real concern I have. And as we look in the world of data aggregation where we're getting tons of material and information about individuals, that's the real concern people have is, can the police track your every single move, even if it's voluntarily and in public? Does the aggregation of the search raise it to a different level of invasiveness and intrusiveness? But that's really the second question, which is, is an unreasonable search. Justice Alito also agreed. He spends a great deal of time talking about the technological future. He says, really the thing that we care about is this kind of aggregation, but he had a different focus, which is the legislature should be doing something about this, worrying about that kind of information, that the courts are not in the best position to be using the, the Fourth Amendment and expectations of privacy to protect individuals. Okay, so that's the basics of Joan, which is it's a search. It's pretty limited in its holding because it really focuses just on property rights, but it's very interesting <coughs> because for quite a while, people had assumed that the property rights analysis um, of the Fourth Amendment was dead, 
And as it turns out, it's very clear from the majority holding that they certainly don't think it's dead. And I would suspect that the conservative core of the court thinks that that's really what the interests, the individual interests are that are protected by the Fourth Amendment. This aggregation stuff and kind of more broad concept of privacy, I suspect, is not going to be uh, supported by um, the conservative core of the court, which we see a little bit in, in the second case, which is um, Florence v. Board of Chosen Freeholders. In this case, there was a petitioner who was arrested during a traffic stop. And are you keeping track of time just so I don't go over? Yes. And where am I on time? Seven. Good, perfect. Um, so uh, in this case, there's a petitioner who's arrested during a traffic stop, and the state trooper checks the computer database, figures out that he actually has not paid a fine, so a minor offense. And um, given that he hasn't, and, and so there's a, a bench warrant that's been issued for his arrest because he hasn't actually paid this little fine. So they detain him at the Burlington County Detention Center. Um, and once, he, once they figure out that, in fact, he had paid the fine, they released him. Okay, so this is an error. He'd actually paid the fine. Um, but in the meantime, in bringing him into the jail, he's in the first jail. Like every detainee there, he had to shower with a delousing agent. He was checked for scars, for marks, gang tattoos, and contraband. Um, and then he had to open his mouth, lift his tongue, hold out his arms, turn around, and lift his genitals. Okay, all naked. Nobody's touching him, but they are requiring that he actually, you know, show that he doesn't have any contraband on him. And at the second jail, he had to remove his clothing uh, while an officer looked for body, mar body markings, uh, tattoos, etc. So twice he is strip searched. Here, the definition of strip search being nobody is touching him, but he is required to stand naked, turn around, move his genitals, show that he doesn't have any contraband. He brings a 1983 claim claiming that the government violated his Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments and that for individuals who have committed minor offenses, that they shouldn't be subject to strip searches. His claim is that the search was unreasonable, so step two analysis, saying that um, the individual interest that he had was a right to privacy, that privacy right protected him against the government um, doing this kind of degrading, humiliating type of search, especially balanced against him being a minor offender. And he loses. And he loses um, uh, with a divided court uh, with a kind of conservative, um, conservative liberal split, where given that they're doing step two analysis, the majority focuses almost exclusively on the government interest at stake. So they never articulate what the individual interest is that you would balance against the government. It's a balancing test at the unreasonableness stage. And they say, especially given that police need to be given broad latitude, and especially given the types of contraband that are brought into prisons, and issues like having lice and other types of bugs and vermin that could be brought in as well, it is reasonable for the police to treat everybody who comes in similarly. And they importantly note that this is not a pat down strip search. Now, why is that important? Because um, as we've seen in a lot of different Fourth Amendment cases, when the court is trying to articulate what the individual interest is that's at stake, they focus very much on physical intrusion. So in Jones, it's property-based physical intrusion on a car. Here, there's no physical intrusion on the person's physical body or space. There's no touching that occurs. Even if there's degradation and humiliation by being forced to expose himself, he's not being subject to any touching whatsoever. They leave an exception. The exception is maybe in future cases for truly minor offenses, it's possible that not everybody would be subject to this type of search. But under the circumstances of this case, they find that it isn't an unreasonable search. Now, what does that leave open? It leaves um, an interesting question if you put these two cases together, which is what beyond physical intrusion is going to be an interest that the court will protect under the Fourth Amendment? Okay, what beyond any sort of physical trespass on the body, on a car, on property, will actually be something that is available? And we'll see that is going to be a major issue in the canine sniffing case this term to figure out are there individual interests that the court considers to be protectable privacy interests under the Fourth Amendment that go beyond physical trespass to the body or to the individual.
Thank you very much, Professor Farahani. We'll hear now from Professor Coleman. <coughs> well, um, <coughs> Professor Siegel said that uh, we were going to talk about consequential uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions. Uh, I'm going to talk about two, one I, which I would not call consequential. Uh, the other, I think, probably is consequential uh, and probably will uh, uh, result in a lot of litigation in the years ahead, some of which probably uh, you will participate in. Um, in the first case, uh, Perry versus New Hampshire, uh, which was decided uh, in January uh, 2012, the Supreme Court decided that due process does not require a trial judge to determine the reliability of eyewitness identification that was obtained under suggestive or highly suggestive circumstances if the police or the state uh, did not have a role in creating the suggestive circumstances. Um, many courts uh, had interpreted the Supreme Court's precedents in this area, which go back to 1967, uh, as applying to any eyewitness identification that, that is obtained under suggestive circumstances. Uh, the court here uh, says, that in, and in, in an eight to one decision, so it wasn't really contested, the court said that, uh, that those precedents apply uh, only where the state has a role in making the identification uh, subjective, uh, suggestive. Uh, a, a group of us, uh, Professor Newman and Vidmar and I met with uh, some uh, neuroscientists and uh, other non-lawyers to talk about uh, eyewitness identification and other things that we were doing uh, relating to wrongful convictions. Uh, and we talked about eyewitness identification and how you know, we have developed over 30 to 40 years of uh, studies indicating how unreliable eyewitness identification is generally, uh, whether circumstances are subjective, suggestive or not. Uh, and they didn't understand if we had that kind of evidence why you know, our uh, courts didn't <coughs> just incorporate that into the rules governing uh, the admissibility of eyewitness identification. And we said, well, that's because you just don't understand how law works. Uh, once the Supreme Court decides uh, as a, a matter of its gut feeling that lay jurors can uh, determine whether an eyewitness identification is reliable, the court basically uh, has been wedded to that notion uh, and you know, it, it resurfaces in, uh, in this case uh, in, in which the court said that uh, you, you don't need uh, to have any kind of a screening mechanism. Uh, you can let the jury hear the, the testimony and decide for itself uh, whether uh, it's reliable. Now, in this case, the facts were very similar to other cases in which uh, wrongful convictions have occurred. Uh, we, we watch a film called Murder on a Sunday Morning uh, in which uh, the police simply pick up a kid on the street because he was black, uh, put him in the police car to talk to him, and the uh, husband of the victim walks up to the police car and when he's about 50 feet away, he said, yeah, that's the guy, uh, because he assumed that the police had done some investigation and that this was the person who had committed the crime, uh, and the 16-year-old boy was uh, charged with the murder and, uh, and prosecuted. Luckily, he had good lawyers, and so he was acquitted, and then they discovered after the acquittal that he, in fact, was innocent. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the, a woman called the police to report uh, that she had seen a black man in the parking lot apparently robbing cars or trying to break into cars. So the police showed up. Uh, one came up to her apartment. Others remained in the parking lot. As she was talking to the officer who had come up to her apartment, she looked out of her kitchen window and saw a black man standing down near one of the officers and said to the officer in her kitchen, that's the person. Um, and so he was charged uh, with the crime. Um, she later was unable to identify him either in a uh, photographic lineup or 
uh, in court, uh, but she was able to testify that she identified him uh, under the circumstances that I described. So the issue was whether the court should determine in advance of the jury, jury hearing her testimony uh, that it was reliable, that it had the indicia of reliability. Uh, and the Supreme Court's decision was that only if the police uh, play a role in creating these suggestive circumstances uh, does due process require some type of uh, determination of the reliability of the out-of-court identification. Um, I don't think that the result was surprising. The court has not uh, seemed very interested in this issue. Uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, dissented, uh, pointing out the 30 or 40 years of uh, evidence that eyewitnesses, eyewitness identifications are unreliable, pointing out that you know that eyewitness identification, misidentification, is a factor in. 79% of the first 252 cases of DNA exonerations, uh, but the court was uh, you know, probably too busy getting geared up for the next case that I'll discuss, <laughs> which is Miller versus Alabama. Uh, one, of the, one of the encouraging things, though, about this area is that state uh, Supreme Courts are moving to deal with the problems of uh, eyewitness identification, and uh, both the Supreme Court of New Jersey and very recently the Supreme Court of Connecticut uh, have issued decisions which places limits on the use of eyewitness identification and also permits the use of experts uh, to explain the unreliability of this type of evidence uh, in criminal cases. So that's the sort of uh, silver lining, I guess, if there is one. Uh, in, in this area. I don't think uh, the Supreme Court is going to sort of re-enter this uh, arena uh, to fix the problem that it's created uh, with the way in which it's approached eyewitness identifications. Um, the other case, though, is uh, significant, Miller versus Alabama. Uh, it's a case um, in which it's a third in a line of cases in which the Supreme Court deals with whether there are limits on the use of severe punishment uh, uh, in the cases of juveniles who commit serious uh, crimes. Uh, in, in 2005, the court decided in uh, Roper versus Simmons uh, that the Eighth Amendment prohibited uh, the death penalty for uh, murderers who were under the age of 18 at the time that they committed uh, the murder. Uh, and then um, two years ago in Graham versus Florida, the Supreme Court uh, decided that uh, the Eighth Amendment prohibited uh, the imposition of a sentence of life without the possibility of parole uh, in a uh, non-homicide uh, case. So the remaining issue is the one that was decided in Miller, uh, which is, uh, is it permissible to uh, impose a mandatory life without possibility of parole uh, in a case where a juvenile is convicted uh, of murder and in the cases where adults are convicted, the sentence is mandatory life without the possibility of parole. Um, in other words, this is a juvenile who has been uh, tried as an adult, convicted, uh, and then for the adult, the sentence would have been life without the possibility of parole. The question is, does the Eighth Amendment prohibit uh, a mandatory sentence of life without the possibility of parole for juveniles? And the court held that it does, uh, although it doesn't, uh, it doesn't prohibit a juvenile from being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, but the state cannot uh, sentence a juvenile to a mandatory sentence of life without the possibility of parole, uh, and instead the uh, state is required to provide individualized sentencing uh, in such a case. Uh, this is based on evidence that juveniles uh, are not fully developed uh, neurologically, and therefore uh, they have poor judgment. Uh, they are not uh, as responsible. They do not have uh, 
adequate control at times over their behavior, uh, and that these things uh, make them less uh, uh, culpable uh, as offenders than uh, an adult <coughs> who is fully developed. And so in light of that, the court said that, <coughs> that a jury uh, has to take into consideration those facts uh, in deciding whether a juvenile uh, should be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Uh, one, one issue that some thought the court might decide was whether there is any age below which uh, a state could not sentence a juvenile to life without the possibility of parole. The court uh, basically ducked that issue uh, and will leave it up to the states to decide uh, how to approach this. The most likely way uh, I think that uh, states will deal with this are probably uh, three. Some states will abolish life without the possibility of parole for juveniles uh, or will abolish it for juveniles under a certain age, 15 or 14, for example. Um, in some cases, I think states will, uh, will start to hold bifurcated hearings uh, after a juvenile is convicted uh, as an adult uh, uh, for a crime that carries a mandatory life without possibility of parole for an adult, uh, and then will uh, consider uh, evidence about uh, the develop child development generally, the development of the particular uh, defendant and his circumstances and background, and then weigh that against the um, uh, the circumstances of the crime uh, and determine whether to uh, sentence him to life without the possibility of parole or to some uh, uh, number of years in prison with then followed by the possibility of parole. I think because the court has left it open, this is going to generate a lot of further litigation. States are going to experiment with different approaches uh, and uh, a lot of those approaches, except when they abolish uh, the, uh, the punishment of life without the possibility of parole, I think uh, that's going to generate quite a bit of uh, further uh, future litigation. Uh, thank you, Professor Coleman. Professor Buell. Okay, so I'm going to talk about plea bargaining because the court decided to talk about it this term <clears throat> in a way that um, it never has before. Well, there are two decisions, both decided 5-4, majority opinions both authored by Justice Kennedy joining the four uh, more liberal uh, members of the court with the remaining conservatives dissenting with Scalia writing both dissents. Um, these cases have potentially huge importance because they uh, have the potential to open up a whole new line of constitutional criminal procedure concerning plea bargaining. And uh, I think almost equally significant is the fact that we see in these opinions the, uh, the court in the person of Justice Kennedy um, explicitly acknowledging what observers have been saying for years about plea bargaining, that is, um, that it, quote, in the words of the late great Bill Stuntz of Harvard Law School, plea bargaining is the criminal justice system in the United States. And um, th those words appeared in Justice Kennedy's um, opinion in one of these two cases, and, and that alone was quite um, remarkable. So for those of you who don't know, this, a lot of this is common knowledge these days, but in, uh, in federal court, 97% of criminal cases are resolved by plea bargain. 94% of criminal cases are resolved by plea bargain in state courts. There has heretofore been only very light constitutional regulation of plea bargaining. There is no right to be offered a plea bargain, and there's no real regulation of prosecutor conduct with regard to plea, plea bargaining. There's a couple of... Um, uh, now fairly old Supreme Court cases called Bordenkircher and Brady, uh, in which the court uh, quite some time ago addressed the question of whether, in fact, there would be limits on what prosecutors are allowed to do in the plea bargaining context. And the answer is essentially no, with the exception of you know, not being able to engage in racial discrimination and other kinds of um, clearly constitutionally prohibited conduct. Um, so it's been a, a greatly increasing concern of lawyers and scholars as the percentages of plea bargain cases have gone up in the last uh, several decades as, at the same time, sentences have increased in our criminal justice system and our prisons have gotten um, embarrassingly stuffed with offenders. Uh, it, we're, you know, in, in the terms of, of some observers, we've become a carceral state. Uh, and all of this is part of a single dynamic, of course. Um, and the particular concern about plea bargaining uh, is, is, is the concern, of course, that innocent people, um, those who both may be 
factually innocent, truly not guilty, and, and also those who, against whom the cases may in fact just be too weak to satisfy the criminal burden of proof, um, have nonetheless been pleading guilty and receiving sentences that are much too long um, as well. So the court joined this discussion this term, um, and that was quite remarkable. Um, I think something that something many thought never would happen, um, and certainly something that made the dissenters quite unhappy. So uh, first case called Missouri versus Fry. Uh, Galen Fry is a fellow who didn't want to stop driving without a license. He'd been convicted of it three times in the state of Missouri. Um, when he was arrested the fourth time, the prosecutor sent his lawyer a letter offering him a plea to either a felony uh, with 10 days of shock time, I don't know what that is, uh, or uh, he could plead to a misdemeanor with 90 days in jail. Um, and his attorney didn't tell him about that letter, he never learned about the plea offer. Um, while the case was going on, he got arrested again a fifth time for driving without a license. Um, and then he finally decided to just plead guilty without a plea agreement. You don't have to have a plea agreement to plead guilty. You can just walk into court and say, Judge, I'd like to plead guilty to everything I've been charged with. And he did that. Um, and the judge put him in prison for three years. So what did the court say? Well, court said the Sixth Amendment, we're in the Sixth Amendment here, by the way. Um, uh, the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to effective assistance of counsel. There's no dispute about that. It's been true for a really long time. Uh, uh, counsel, uh, the, the right to counsel attaches at charging, not at trial, when you're charged with a crime, and it includes uh, the right to effective assistance in all kinds of pretrial stuff. There's no dispute about that. It hasn't been for a long time. Uh, the test, about which there's also no dispute and is well settled, is a two-pronged test, whether counsel's uh, performance fell below an objective standard of reasonableness, and uh, two, whether that, uh, if so, that caused prejudice to the defendant. Now, uh, <laughs> Here, not telling, you know, court says, look, not telling uh, your client about a plea offer from the prosecutor falls below the objective standard of reasonableness, and uh, nobody really is going to argue with that proposition. Um, but the, the question all really re revolves around prejudice here, and uh, th that was the big move. The court did say there was prejudice here. Um, if, in fact, on remand, the defendant can show a reasonable probability that he would have accepted the plea offer that he wasn't told about, that the prosecutor would not have withdrawn that offer, which the prosecutor had, has the power to do in Missouri, apparently, and that the judge would have accepted it. So remand to decide those questions, and if so, uh, the, this is this ineffective assistance claim under the Sixth Amendment, a so-called Strickland claim in the plea bargaining context wins. Um, and the remedy would be that he gets the plea that he never knew about in the first place. So Justice Scalia says in dissent, um, yes, the Sixth Amendment right includes all this pretrial, uh, you know, effective assistance during pretrial stuff, but only because the right is there to guarantee a fair trial. Um, since there's no right to a plea at all, there could possibly, there couldn't possibly be, you know, there's there's no right to have a plea offer made in the first place. There couldn't possibly be a Sixth Amendment violation in not being told about it, if there were one. Um, and he called the court's prejudiced in inquiry, these questions that had to be asked on remand, a process of retrospective crystal ball gazing posing as legal analysis, and said, uh, you know, it's just not, these, these, these are kind of a hypothetical inquiry. Now we have to go back in a time machine and ask what would have happened if the guy had known about the plea. And Scalia said, that's just ridiculous. That doesn't, that's not adjudication in any recognizable form. And uh, of course he warns, you know, get ready to open the floodgates because everybody's coming now to say, uh, you know, there could have been or would have been or should have been a plea I didn't know about. Um, now, the other case called Laffler versus Cooper, I think, is a bigger deal and extends the point even more uh, uh, controversially. So Blaine Laffler, who Neil mentioned earlier, um, shot a lady in the hip, the abdomen, and the buttocks, and she lived. And um, so, you know, you remember thinking that's criminal law, first-year fact pattern. That would be attempted murder, right? Um, so that, in fact, is what he was charged with. And the prosecutor offered to dismiss some of the charges and recommend a sentence of 51 to 85 months. The defense attorney advised the client, and there was no dispute about this as, as the case arrived at the Supreme Court level, um, no, you shouldn't take that plea. Uh, you know, we, we can try this case. We've got a defense on intent to kill because you shot her below the waist. Um, so the defendant thought, all right, yeah, let's, let's go for it. Uh, went to trial, uh, shockingly was convicted on all counts, and then received a sentence of 185 to 360 months, a lot more than the plea offer. Um, so, uh, so court uh, takes on this one and it says, okay, you know, Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to effective assistance of counsel. Counsel right attaches a charging and it includes with respect to pretrial stuff. 
Uh, the Strickland test is, did it fall below the objective standard of reasonableness and was there prejudice? You know, everybody's on board to this point. Um, telling the defendant that he can win on these facts on a shoot below the waist uh, argument falls below the objective standard of reasonableness. And, and that was one that nobody was really going to fight on either. So we're all on board to that point. But then, of course, we get to the prejudice thing again. And, uh, and here's where the court splits. So what Justice Kennedy says is the prejudice question here is, is there a reasonable pro probability that the plea offer would have been accepted by the defendant uh, in the absence of the advice that we go to trial on the shoot below the waist argument, um, that it would not have been withdrawn by the prosecutor, that it would have been presented to the court, that the court would have accepted it, and that the conviction in the sentence would have been less than what the defendant got after he went to trial and got convicted and was sentenced after trial. Um, and if, in fact, we conclude all that's true, then the remedy can vary. It's in the trial, trial court's discretion whether to make the prosecutor re-offer the, 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 the plea bargain, uh, whether to overturn any of the defendant's convictions from the trial, whether to re-sentence the defendant to a different sentence than the, the defendant had received after trial. Um, and Justice Kennedy uh, adds the argument that a fair trial, because of course this is so different from the other case. Here we have a defendant not who uh, didn't hear about a plea offer and then ended up pleading to something more. Here's a defendant who got a plea offer, turned it down, went to trial, and got convicted. And uh, Kennedy says the argument that a fair trial wipes clean any ineffective assistance claim uh, with regard to the plea bargaining process ignores the reality that plea bargaining is the criminal justice system in the United States now. And that, I think, is one of the most significant things I've heard the Supreme Court say in criminal law and criminal procedure in a very long time. Now, a lot of times the Supreme Court says something that seems like earth's earth shattering at the time, and then we all just kind of move on and not a lot happens. So I'm not saying this is going to change the world, but I, I think that's really quite a remarkable development. Um, Scalia, again, dissents, uh, laments that we've now created a whole new field of constitutionalized plea bargaining law that it could apply to anything, including what prosecutors are allowed to offer, not offer, etc. Um, he calls this a judicially invented right to effective plea bargaining. Um, again, he says the Strickland right is to ensure a fair trial. Nobody says this guy didn't get a fair trial. End of story. Uh, there can't be a Strickland violation when someone's had a fair trial. And he says the court's incoherent discussion of how the trial court would deal with this on remand shows that the court knows there's no real violation here in the first place. You know, Scalia never questioning the inner thinking or motives of the other side. <laughs> um, plea bargaining, this is the part I love in the, in the dissent in, in, in Laffler. Plea bargaining is an embarrassment, says Scalia. Um, but the way to avoid that is to have trials, which is exactly what happened here. And then he starts talking about European systems in which there's no plea bargaining allowed, and everything has to be tried, and you get what the law says you're supposed to get when you're convicted. And he calls such systems, European systems, mind you, and I'm quoting him, admirable. <laughs> and then he says, and then this is, and then he says, by the way, the reason we have so much plea bargaining is that the court has created lots of made up criminal procedure law that delays and imposes expenses that makes everyone want to plead out cases. Um, okay, so this is a lot of fun. And actually, these, these opinions are mercifully short, so I recommend reading them. Um, uh, I, you know, all I have to add to this is who knows what's going to happen with regard to either the threatened floodgates here or really, more importantly, the doctrine. Because they've opened up this new area. And of course, whenever the Supreme Court does this, we need a lot more case law before we're going to know how this is all going to play out. Um, it's very interesting that this is happening. Again, here we are with new criminal procedure in the, in the current Supreme Court coming out of the Sixth Amendment. So we've got all the sentencing stuff that's happened in the last decade coming out of the Sixth Amendment jury trial right. We've got all the evidentiary stuff involving hearsay that's been going on coming out of the Sixth Amendment confrontation clause right. And now we have a new line of stuff coming out of the effective assistance of counsel clause in the Sixth Amendment. And it's, it's as if, you know, this court decided that the Warren court had ruined, you know, the Fourth and Fifth Amendment for purposes of doing anything in criminal procedure. If we're going to do anything new and interesting, we have to do it in the Sixth because, you know, nobody's really done a lot with the Sixth Amendment. So um, now, the, 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 as Professor Griffin knows, knows better than, than, than me, the, the Confrontation Clause stuff hasn't worked out so well. Um, and the sentencing stuff, a lot of people have argued, hasn't worked out so well either. So uh, even those who are celebrating the fact that the Supreme Court has now intervened in this plea bargaining thing, 
um, I think are, you know, in, in, if they were being candid, would be a little bit apprehensive about whether this is actually going to work out in terms of theory and doctrine. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, finally, I would just note this is, you know, yet more evidence for the fact that it just could not be clearer that Justice Kennedy continues to listen to the legal academy and to advocates in the criminal justice system about its woes, and he's worried about it, and he's trying to find ways to address it. Thank you. May you all be as excited and energized by your reading for class <laughs> as Professor Beulah's reading Justice Scalia. Uh, Professor Griffin. Uh, that was a perfect setup because, of course, I'm going to talk about the Sixth Amendment and um, have to say that Justice Scalia has uneven affection for the Sixth Amendment because he's very fond of the jury trial provisions mm -hmm. and he is very fond of the Confrontation Clause and obviously has um, a less robust approach to the ineffective mm -hmm. assistance of counsel cases. It's, um, it's kind of the odd bedfellows amendment, too. Um, and it has gotten to a place where I'm going to talk about one case, um, which I chose because um, at the end of the line here, I figured I should keep it as short as possible, and also because it's a little bit of a self-contained demonstration of some of the things that others have mentioned in terms of the court's approach to criminal procedure. That case is Williams versus Illinois. Um, and it is, uh, as I said, about the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment, which provides that criminal defendants have the right to be confronted with the witnesses against them. Um, as you might expect, um, this uh, part of the Constitution, like many other parts, has a contested history. The dominant origin story for this clause is that it comes to us uh, from trials like Sir Walter Raleigh's historic treason trial, um, during which he famously protested that he was being tried by affidavit and that though the witnesses were in custody and next to the courthouse where um, his trial was taking place, they were not brought into court um, in order for him to be able to question them. And until 2004, the Supreme Court read this Confrontation Clause provision um, to basically mean that evidence that is not otherwise somehow characterized as reliable requires live testimony in court um, before it can be admitted in a criminal case. And the determination that evidence was somehow reliable tended to track very closely the hearsay exceptions um, and the determination whether something fit or did not fit within the exceptions that allow for the introduction of statements that are made out of court without live testimony by the witness who's making those statements. Then everything changed um, in 2004 in a decision called Crawford, which um, is another great example of something that Professor Buell was talking about, which is sometimes the court says things that strike you as earth shattering at the time, and whether they are or are not remains to be seen. Um, the Crawford series of cases, some of you are my evidence students, and um, we will spend a great deal of time on this, but they are, uh, they're a wonderful demonstration of how quickly the court's jurisprudence can contract. Um, with respect to criminal procedure, a lot of things, it took a whole generation before Miranda effectively became a dead letter. That process started soon after the Miranda decision in the 70s, and, but through the 70s, 80s, 90s to now, we've watched in a generation it contract. The rejuvenated right to confrontation that the court announced in Crawford, which was to set aside reliability. Justice Scalia authored the opinion. Um, it's something that um, he, he clings to and feels passionate about. Um, he, his point is that confrontation is a procedural and not a substantive guarantee um, in much the same way that you wouldn't say that someone has to forgo a criminal trial just because they're obviously guilty. You don't have to forgo cross-examination just because the evidence is obviously reliable. It's a procedural guarantee to which all criminal defendants are entitled so long as the out-of-court statement in question is testimony of some sort, is testimonial in the words that the court used. Um, within about five years, um, that came to mean very little. Um, so those sort of aftermarket modifications after the announcement of a new constitutional right are very, very condensed um, with respect to this case, which is why it's generated a firestorm of commentary. Um, Williams is also a terrific case because um, it is the area of the law in which I think the court uh, looks and acts the most like Congress, um, by which I mean not that they are legislating from the bench, but that they are entirely and completely gridlocked um, and are, will never get anything done. There is little sign of movement on either side. There is a 4-1-4 split in case after case after case since Crawford, and they are willing to flay each other's reasoning and opinions in ways you rarely see them do, even in some of the more contested areas of the past term and recent ones, 
Um, so it's, a, it's, it's the court um, as Congress. Um, so to focus specifically on the Williams case, um, one area that has been particularly fraught for the court, this is the third case that has decided on this very issue, is okay, if criminal defendants have the right to confront witnesses against them who are making out-of-court statements, does that include laboratory reports? reports by forensic examiners. Does that mean that if an analyst determines that white powder is cocaine or that there is a certain percentage of alcohol in a blood sample, that that very analyst has to appear in court? And you can immediately see the administrability concerns from the perspective of the criminal justice system. In the Williams case, there is a more complex sort of laboratory report, DNA analysis. Um, and the Williams case involves the linking of the defendant, Sandy Williams, um, to a semen swab from a rape victim. Um, another interesting fact about the case, it's not a jury trial, it's a bench trial um, in front of the judge. And as is commonly happens, the critical lab technician who in the years before the trial began performed this analysis is not available, is a missing witness, not available to testify at the trial. And what is often done in this situation is that a different technician from the same laboratory or a supervisor from the same laboratory will come in and testify and present the analyst's results and explain why and how they determined that the white powder was cocaine or that percentage of alcohol was in the blood sample or in this case that the DNA from the defendant matches the sample from the rape victim. Um, and in two previous cases, Melendez Diaz and Bullcoming, the court along four one four lines um, with uh, plurality decisions that basically arrived at the conclusion that yes, laboratory technicians themselves have to be confronted um, by the defendant. Um, the fault lines are these. So Justices Scalia and Ginsburg um, are in one clear camp. They were initially joined by Justice Stevens and Justice Souter. They are now joined repeatedly by Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan. All four of them believe that admission of these sorts of laboratory reports constitutes a confrontation violation, um, and they've adhered to that position. Justice Kennedy, um, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Breyer, and Justice Alito believe introduction of these sorts of reports to be constitutional. Justice Thomas is the one, um, and he has staked out some very clear, repeatedly articulated um, territory, which is that only those out-of-court statements that are so formal that they resemble the very sorts of affidavits that were at question in this or Walter Raleigh trolley, Walter Raleigh trial I mentioned. That's a mouthful. Um, if it's formal, if it looks like an ex parte affidavit or a deposition or a grand jury testimony, then it's testimonial and confrontation is required. If it doesn't, it doesn't. This led him to switch um, in the Williams case. Um, for reasons that Justice Kagan said didn't constitute a nickel's worth of difference. So in the two previous cases, in Bullcoming and in Melendez-Diaz, the laboratory analyst had actually prepared something that looked like an affidavit or had a thing on it, a stamp, a seal, something that said a certificate. In the Williams case, there was no such formal designation um, for the analyst's report. And for that reason, Justice Thomas switched and said, no, this is not a confrontation violation to let the laboratory report in. Um, Justice Alito auth authored the plurality opinion, which Justice Kagan said she would call a plurality because that was the <coughs> convention, but that it should not be viewed as a plurality because there are only four justices who agree with any aspect of the, of the reasoning or any paragraph of its explication, um, <laughs> which is, is her exact words, it's exact, and it's actually true, because Justice Thomas disagrees with every single thing that Justice Alito says, except he concurs in the outcome because he, there wasn't a stamp or seal um, on the, literally, on the analyst's report. Um, but Justice Alito deems this um, not to be testimonial for a very quirky technical reason, which is, that the way the government, this is extremely clever, got the DNA analysis in is that they called as a witness someone they qualified as an expert. And experts are allowed to rely on hearsay. They're allowed to rely on things they've learned from other sources. So the expert witness testified, I've done some DNA analysis, and here are my conclusions about the DNA in the case. And by the way, in doing so, in reaching those conclusions, I relied on this report from this missing witness concluding that the defendant's DNA and the sample from the rape victim match. Um, and so Justice Alito was willing to go along with that um, over Justice Kagan's vigorous dissent. 
um, on the ground that you know she called it prosecutorial obfuscation, and um, to a certain extent it was too clever. Um, but Justice Alito agreed that in the lab report is not being offered for its truth because it's just an expert relying on some other information that was an input for that expert's opinion. Um, I've mentioned Justice Thomas's position. Um, Justice Kagan, in a very sort of colloquial opinion for her, says, been there, done that. Literally, we've decided this case. This is Bull Cumming and Melendez Diaz. Forget about the certification issue. Um, we shouldn't be having this debate. Here's what's interesting about her opinion. Most of it is occupied with a story about an entirely different rape case from San Diego with very, very similar forensic analysis in which an error was made and the defendant was innocent. And she tells the story of the types of errors that a DNA analyst might make that might be exposed by cross-examination and that were not questioned in this case. And what's interesting about that is that she's suggesting that what's important is whether the testimony is the type of thing for which cross-examination would be error exposing, which brings the court full circle <laughs> exactly back to its concern with reliability, which is what, what the state of the law was before Crawford. <laughs> Um, so that's the court coming full circle and um, ending in a 414 gridlock, which is extremely unlikely to be resolved by any case on the horizon. But maybe by an election. But perhaps in November, right? Right. In the aftermath. Well, thank thank you all very uh, very much. We've got uh, we've got about eight minutes of time for questions. Anyone want to ask a question? Well, then let me ask a question. Uh, this won't, uh, this won't apply to every one of the cases we discussed, but it'll apply to several of them. Uh, to what extent are we being governed by Justice Tony Kennedy's gut in the area of constitutional criminal procedure? <laughs> and, to, and by his gut, I mean his intuitions and moral idealism and his diffuse views about liberty and humanity and dignity. And to the extent I have very little use for being governed by Tony Kennedy's gut, when it comes to race cases and when it comes to federalism and health care, why should I be pleased to be governed by his gut just because he renders decisions that I happen to agree with politically? <laughs> More pointedly. Question mark. <laughs> where does Miller versus Alabama come from? Is this is Tony Kennedy really pouring over the new neuroscience and just being persuaded by all the studies and saying categorically? I'll tell you that I had an interesting conversation with Kennedy um, about neuroscience uh, where before that case, so at the Ninth Circuit Conference last year, um, and where he really sat down to just have a conversation with me, like, what does neuroscience tell us? I mean, teetering on this case to wanting to know exactly, like, you know, can it actually answer these questions? He is utterly fascinated by neuroscience and issues of responsibility and culpability, and um, I, I mean, really utterly fascinated. At the same time, he gave the most incoherent um, lecture that I've ever heard. So I'm not sure if all of his synapses are totally uh, firing. And so I'd say, um, to the extent that you are worried, I wouldn't worry so much about ideology as synapses. Yeah, and I, I don't, yeah I wouldn't even call it ideology in the conventional sense. I don't think he's, um, but I just mean, he had, jails are dangerous places. Right, and so the mandatory strip search, well, you know, uh, the government knows what they're doing um, and is something really distasteful about sentencing a juvenile to life without possibility of parole on a mandatory basis. But you would think he would yeah. sign on if he was really interested in the concept of dehumanization and degradation and mm -hmm. really interested in those issues that he would have signed on with um, the liberal justices uh, in Florence, right, who spent mm -hmm. a, a good deal of time talking about the concept of dehumanization and degradation in jail, and particularly strip, strip searches, and mm -hmm. you know he's he's not that concerned about those types of issues. And he, on Fourth Amendment cases, when those types of privacy interests are talked about, he signs on with the conservatives to say the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect those types of expectations of privacy. So I'm not I'm not sure he's so consistent ideologically in mm -hmm. those ways. Yeah, I'm not sure but, if that makes but, it better or worse. But he was consistent in Miller with Roper and mm -hmm. with Graham. So. Uh, you know, so it wasn't a surprise that he would come out the same way unless 
you know, Anita convinced him that neuroscience was right. bunk and, you know. <laughs> I, that's not, I, I did no such thing. I said that especially when it comes to juveniles, it is the most compelling. So, okay. No, but I, I'm not, I don't think it's surprising either. But when he was here a few years ago, he said, people call me judgmental. He says, well, what else am I supposed to be? I'm a judge. And when I get a case, I, it does, it, does this cohere with my own sense of morality and fairness? And as if that's just completely uncon uncontroversial. He's well, got when, you're, when you're talking about something like the Eighth Amendment, mm -hmm. right, which is um, cruelty, what is the definition of cruelty? Uh, it seems like it's not, it, you know, the, the test has built in now the justice's conception of morality, you know, explicitly in Atkins, explicitly in Roper, explicitly that, in each of those cases, they say an independent judgment by the justices right. is part of the, you know, part of what's at stake in these cases. So I would think for him to do that in those cases when they've set that out as the task, but not in the Fourth Amendment cases is consistent with the jurisprudence and, you know, less concerning to me if it is one step of a test of determining right. cruelty. I would but, say, yes, Justice Kennedy has said that and the liberals have gone with him, and now he's applying his own test, which means his own moral judgment determines the outcome, right? And well, I mean, evolving standards of decency isn't all that much different from emerging expectations of privacy. I mean, you can, those you could, things but, are- But you could actually look at what's going on in the states and take it seriously, or you can do that as window dressing and then just impose your moral judgment, right? What's going on? Okay, other questions. We have uh, <laughs> a few more minutes. Yes? This was uh, this goes back to the testimonial case. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering with Alito's reasoning that on the one hand he harped on this one rule about hearsay being the confrontation clause of constitutional, how do you get from something that's like manufactured as just a subset to govern certain procedures and then use that to reason for a constitutional argument about someone's rights? It has an alternative holding. So the, the, there are two holdings in the Alito plurality decision. Um, the first is that because it's not offered for its truth, the inquiry into reliability is unnecessary, both as a matter of evidence law and as a matter of constitutional law. The alternative holding is that within the Crawford jurisprudence, there is this doctrine that if there is an ongoing emergency, that the statement is not testimonial because its intent is different from trying to prepare for some future trial. And he also, argued that because there might have been some rapist at large and the goal of doing the analysis was to determine who that person might be or whether the right person had been apprehended, that there was an ongoing emergency. And also, and this is the interesting thing, which I think has a little bit more heft to it, he makes the point that when doing a DNA analysis, and a lab technician isn't really clear on whether it's for purposes of exoneration or inculpation because DNA swings both ways in the criminal justice process. Whereas when handed a bag of white powder, the analyst knows that the anticipated outcome of the test is this is drugs. Um, when given a blood sample and asked to test for alcohol, the analyst knows that the anticipated outcome is this person was legally intoxicated. And there, there is that danger of manipulation, that concern that a lab technician might actually push the evidence in the direction the government expects and wants it to go, whereas with DNA, there's a little bit more level of a playing field and that labs do work on both sides and might not necessarily be manipulating it. And that, but interestingly, again, that concern with manipulation is the fundamental reliability concern the court began with and theoretically transcended after Crawford, but they haven't really gotten there. Another question? Yes. Jones case, the GPS case, uh, where, where would that leave something like the use of um, like robots or drones in surveilling a uh, suspect other than using physical GPS to fix the car? So you mean like satellite or drones from above, something like that, like yeah, going over open fields? Even closer to the car, but not quite a fix. Like something that maybe you know, tailed, tailed it by a few feet, but wasn't physically on the property of it. So Jones doesn't answer that question, right? I mean, the open fields cases and the aerial surveillance cases right now suggest, you know, that that's okay, that you can do those types of things. Now, the dissents uh, suggest that there is a concern about the degree of surveillance that happens and the aggregation of surveillance, and there's clearly a divide on the court over this issue as to whether in the technological age, uh, you know, new technologies that enable you to, 
be able to aggregate a tremendous amount of information may be different than you know a single flyover a car or a single flyover the backyard of a home. Um, and so the collection of the data may intrude on something more like an informational privacy kind of um, interest that you might have. The court hasn't recognized any sort of informational privacy right now in the Fourth Amendment, but um, they might. Right, the, the, that's clearly what they're struggling with in these cases. And the case this term on canine sniffing um, will you know, revisit the question of whether or not not physically trespassing but getting at content information um, of a home, uh, whether or not that could actually uh, violate the Fourth Amendment or if you have an individual interest that's implicated. So has a search occurred under those circumstances? So open question still, but clearly a contested open question. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thanks to our panelists for uh, sharing their insights with us. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.